up, my people? Welcome to Fellowship Bible Church's Sermon Spotlight, where we're coming at you each and every week uh, with the opportunity to debrief uh, the weekend that we just had uh, and send biblical truth. Thank you so much for being a part of that. Uh, I'm one of your hosts, Caleb Pearson. Joining me again, Mark Francis. Mark, hey, man. Hey, how are you? You know, Good. I've always got to, I've always had to, have to critique your opening intro there. And well, this was a little... It's a little soft, you know. I, I are, wanted are you it, excited this morning? I, I so I am excited. I wanted it to be softer. Okay. I thought about it driving here this morning. I said I've been a little loud <laughs> right off the bat, um, <laughs> and I want to I want to ease people into the conversation. But I'll be honest, you did throw me off halfway through because you started laughing. I need to not look at it's, you. It's good to know that you are very intentional in how you speak and everything you say. <laughs> well, what I need to do important. is look at John or Alicia, not you. That's the, I think that's the, <laughs> the intro. Uh, after her wonderful week off, I'm assuming, uh, she's back, Alicia Battaglia. Alicia, how are you? I am well. Awesome. And so the people that I talk to actually like your energetic introduction, and they? they look forward to the what's up, my people. So, okay. Um, you know, just, so what you're yeah, saying is I'm, I've disappointed everybody. <laughs> Let's go back to the right. one. Okay. All yeah, right. Well, that's yeah. good. So, I think consistency might be okay. might be better. Okay. Wow. Thank you guys. <laughs> this is humbling. This is humbling. Uh, do you want to do you want to give us your your flower intro? Yeah, I know. So, uh, so um so today the highlight picture is the purple cone flower that's blooming out in my front yard right now, and unfortunately. The I have lilies that are behind there, and then another really pretty purple flower called Blazing Star, but it didn't make the cut of the frame. So, um, anyway, I guess you what just you have gonna, to come to my house. What are you going to do in the winter when you have no flowers to take pictures of? Well, if if we're still zooming in the winter, <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> I have we got bigger I have problems. A lot <laughs> of house plants. I have a lot of house plants, so I'll just start going around. I I mean. I could take pictures 365 days a year. So, yeah. Well, we missed you. Thank you for being back. And then joining us, uh, I think for the third and final time, at least for the next good while, uh, Pastor John Morrison wearing his Tiger Woods Sunday best. John, how you doing, man? I'm doing well. It's good to see you guys. I figured yeah. with that intro that you and Mark had, we probably ought to start immediately with verse 29. Let no <laughs> out of your mouth i mean yeah, you know, yeah. but only such a word is as good for edification sounds like we were doing a little application there right that's true that's very true Sorry discussion <laughs> i'm glad you're here to enter to be the mediator mediator there john thank you appreciate it <laughs> oh man good to be back guys um, why don't we jump into a Sunday in review? Again, thank you to our listeners. Reminder, you can find us at fbcva.life slash summer spotlight and be a part of the show. So if any questions come up uh, in your mind about the past weekend or even the podcast, feel free to shout it out. Uh, John, why don't you share with us briefly about uh, what we were reading this past Sunday, and then we'll all kind of jump in here. Okay. Uh, just to remind us that it's always so helpful to make sure that we get context whenever we're going to go into any passage in the scripture. It's one of the most overlooked principles of biblical interpretation for many. But sure. with context, in Ephesians chapter 4, we move to this hyper-practical part of the book where he's laid a doctrinal foundation, and he's now going to say, here's what to do with it. And he's told us in the first six verses of the chapter to pursue unity. And he explains some specific characteristics that are required in our lives to build unity. Then, in verses 7 through 16, he lays out for us the next principle that's really important if we're going to walk worthy of the calling we've received. And that is every single person who's a member of the body of Christ. Not member, I mean, it's good to join a church. And I would hope that everybody here, if you're a Christian, that you and you're part of Fellowship Bible Church, you would become officially and formally a member of Fellowship Bible Church. That's a good thing. But he's referring more in the idea that everybody who's a believer and connected to a local church, because that's how membership was then. You were just connected to the church of which you were, uh, that you were most closely um, associated with geographically. Um, everybody is to minister according to the gifts God's given them. Uh, one of the weak, weakest things that will happen in a church is if everybody is not fulfilling their role, uh, if everyone is not using what God's given them, the church will be weaker. It will be less mature, and it will be less like Christ. So that was the second part. Now this third part, we basically talked the, the, the whole message, verses 17 through 32, really revolved around one verse in verse 17 when the Apostle Paul said, This I say, therefore, 
and affirm together with the Lord. So this is not only me saying it under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, it's something Jesus has communicated as well. And he and I together are affirming this before you, that you walk no longer as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind. In other words, the rest of the passage is teaching Christians how to no longer walk like they once did. And what we said that was important is to realize he wouldn't give that warning unless that was possible. Uh, in fact, I don't think he would give that warning unless some people were actually doing what he was warning them against. Because he says, walk no longer this way. That is to say, stop doing what, what you might be doing right now that was similar to what people do who don't know Jesus. And the rest of the passage from 18 through 32 is essentially a very practical conversation, series of exhortations and reminders to help people say, you know, your relationships really should look different now that you're a Christian. If you're relating with people and you're relating with these various things that he talks about, like people do who aren't Christians, or like you once did before you were a Christian, you've really missed the boat. Because when Jesus saved you, he didn't save you to go on living like you once did. So that's the picture. And uh, obviously, there are a lot of subsections in that. Um, sure. Yeah. I mean, it's a it's a really busy passage. But I like what you said there just about the, the reminders. You know, we have this first 17 and then we have 18 through 32 there. Uh, I, I liked how you dove into um, verse 20, but that is not the way you learned Christ. And then talking a little bit about what that means and, uh, again, about what has already happened in the life of a believer. Yes. Uh, and, and you talked about um, the different translations and how they're saying to put off your old self or to do these things and how the original Greek is, is referring to actually what has already been done. And so it's, it's embracing. Right. It's, the, it's the mental reminder, like you said. And I, that is just huge for me, pivotal for me, has been. Uh, and mm -hmm. I think will be for people who are interested in learning more about what the scripture is saying. Yeah, I love that yeah. too, because there's this <laughs> idea that basically, John, you kind of somewhat touched on it just right now, but also in your sermon of how there's people out there that would argue and say, well, maybe you never were a Christian. But this is speaking to believers that we are capable of these things. And, 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 and yet we can put off that old self and put on the new self and have that ability to to walk not like a Gentile or not like an unbeliever. Do you want to kind of insert that word? And and I didn't know if there was anything that you've seen in the world today of just kind of in, in the Christian circles where you run into people who are are struggling with that concept because I have and I find that it's it's relieving when you can recognize that we have we are sealed and marked by the Holy Spirit with our salvation. And that is firm and secure. And to, to either judge other people to say that, you know, you might not be a Christian because you're not walking that way. It can really be harmful. And, and so it's, to me, this passage is another reassurance of, of that security, but also of that ability that we, we can walk according to the spirit and not, the flesh really and, and so i didn't know if there was any if you guys had any experience with that because i certainly have where just had conversations with others where you've had to remind them yeah yeah alicia what has that been like for you uh, over the last couple of weeks well i think that we we can be prone to legalist thinking of like okay i'm saved i've got to put off the old put on the new how do i do that and but there is this process of sanctification that is being worked in our lives. And the word that jumped out to me is in verse 24, the word created. And um, so, well, first back up to 23, and to be renewed in the spirit of your mind and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God and the true righteousness and holiness. And that word created, that's not something that we do. That's something that God does. He creates this new person and he creates us in his likeness. And so these, um, the putting off and the putting on of the new self is something that God is working in us. And it's, it's a process. And it's, um, I was so convicted throughout the sermon and through this text, it just, uh, it's, 
you know, one convicting arrow to another, but it's good because it's, I think that that brings life. It shows that we have life. And it speaks to John's point. The old self is still there. And the Bible is very clear about that, but it's not our identity anymore. Right. And that's so often the problem. I mean, that was, that was hammered into my head through the internship, through all these different opportunities of talking to people. It's like, wow, it really is coming down to our understanding of identity when it, when it comes right. to what we're dealing with or what we feel like can consume us. Because I'm no stranger to that feeling that my identity is in my old corrupt self, but at least I have Christ. Because there, there's a positive outlook to that. And at first glance, that sounds pretty sweet. I know I'm a miserable human being. Um, but it's not true that I am a depraved sinner. I was a depraved sinner, and now I am in Christ, and Christ is in me. And so that identity helps me handle, I think, that, that old self. And the opposite holds true, too, because you can think, oh, I'm better than the other person right. next is to it? me, and I'm not as depraved as that person. And then you get into that judgmentalism that, John, you mentioned in the sermon that is so self-absorbed, so self-focused, and not looking at others in the proper view of how God sees them. It's almost like you need to look at people with God lenses <laughs> and, and, and not judge people according to how we see them. Because if that's the case, then we're all going to fall short and then we're sinning by, by doing that. And it's, it, it is definitely, like you said, Alicia, very hard hitting to hear point after point after point. And John, I appreciated your, your candor in, in kind of just revealing some of the things about your life and that that's helpful to kind of see applications again just pointing to say hey here's here's where i've messed up and you know it's real it's authentic and mm -hmm. i think for people to hear that is is helpful well i think with respect to this whole topic what's really important about verses 21 through 24 um and and a couple of you have touched on this that what it's referring to uh, when he says, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him as truth is in Jesus, uh, he, isn't, he isn't here directly raising the question, are you a Christian? What he's saying is, in view of the fact that I'm writing to Christians, when you hear me say, if indeed you've been taught, you haven't been taught this way, everybody ideally would lean forward and go, as a matter of fact, he's right. I was never taught that I'm supposed to be saved and go on living like I did before. Yep. It was right. never about that. I mean, if we want proof of it, just back up two chapters to chapter two, verses eight, nine, and 10. Because eight and nine make it plain that you're saved by grace through faith. Yeah. But it doesn't leave you there because verse 10 says, for we're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he prepared beforehand for us to walk in. And if you were to even go back to chapter one, you would see that we have received these blessings in the heavenlies and are in Christ. He says, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ, over and over in chapters one and following. But here's the thing for us to understand about this. Verses 25 through 32 are all exhortations. They're all things to work towards, to do. They're commands, they're reminders, they're instructions. They're all to do. Verse 21 through 24 is not that. Um, even this morning, as some of us have quoted 22 and 24, we have, uh, whether, I don't know whether it is as an illustration or, or accidentally, but we repeated the phrases in 22 and 24 that most versions have, like you laid aside the old self, you put on. I mean, uh, lay aside the old self and put on the new self. And one of the things we talked about was that's not what it really says is you laid aside the old self, you put on the new, meaning past tense. And the reason that's important is, and it touches on, I think it was Alicia, the comment that she made, 21 through 24 essentially provides a foundation upon which 25 through 32 is possible, meaning it's because of the change that occurred when you became a Christian that you can now do these new things. I can remember as a Christian thinking, man, I, I don't see I could ever really overcome a, uh, uh, a daily struggle with lust or a, a regular struggle with anger. Or re I, just, I couldn't see how a person could live a victorious life if there were things that caught them up regularly. Well, what this is saying is, wait a minute. 
you already laid that aside. You already put on a new self. Now what we're going to do is give instructions on how to actually walk that out. And I think that's really important because if people feel, feel like they're being told to lay aside the old self, they'll always wonder, have I done it well enough? You know, did I do it Thursday, but not Friday? They'll all in this position yeah. of examining. When in reality, it's an identity truth. Like Caleb said, you already did that. It happened when you were saved. For that reason, that's the reason you don't go on living like you used to. And if you do, let's say you act out like you used to, you need to be reminded by your Holy Spirit, by the Holy Spirit and by your friends and by just even within yourself going, wait a minute, that's not me anymore. Even if I've always done that, it's not me. You know, even if that's been a pattern in my life, as long as I've been an adult, that's not me. And that is the, 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 spiritual, the spiritual connotation there. Even if I've always done it, it's uh -huh. not me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, it is so hard to to reveal that to people, mm -hmm. or, or or get to a point where Scripture can you know peel back those layers and open up our eyes to say, okay, whoa, uh, maybe the Bible is literal about my new nature and that I am in Christ right now. Because we look at each, you know, your identity to me, my identity to you, it has nothing to do with very easy for it to have nothing to do with our spirituality. But the, the Bible is looking at us by this lens and defining things by this lens, the lens of right, right or wrong in, in Christ or in the flesh. And man, it, you have to break down that, that mental pattern, um, the, 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 the tracks in the mind, the ruts, that, the ruts of thinking that, that are there to realize. It's, 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 if we're changing our moral clothes, our, our hearts and our minds are being transformed and we're putting on a whole new moral clothing that reflects Christ and it it's not about us anymore it's about him and it reflects him and it also encourages others and it's for the good of our neighbor and um so we don't we're not the only ones that get to benefit from the work that God's doing in our lives that flows out to others as well can I that's the whole can I can I both agree and disagree with what you said? Um, sure. <laughs> in this, in, well, in this sense, I think this is important, and it may be that you're assuming the part that I'm going to disagree with, meaning it, it doesn't even need to be said. I think I went 25 years not thinking it needed to be said, but now I realize in the last 10 years, it's like, no, I don't think I grasped it importantly enough for my own life. You made the comment about the progressive sense of sanctification. And I agree with that. But I think that before we speak about the progressive aspects, with it, which has to do with how am I actually living out this faith, it's important to start out with what has already happened. And I am, um, Alicia, I'm trying to remember the phrase you used. You said, um, when you were talking about clothing, you said, you know, it's like we're, we're in a process of putting on new clothing. And, and I think what I would say, here's where my slight difference would be. I would say... We've already been clothed. <laughs> we've already been clothed, exactly. The old has been put away, the new has been put on. Now I need to live out that new clothing, so to speak. And mm -hmm. it's interesting to use that analogy because in Zechariah chapter... It's either chapter 3 or chapter 6. Um, I don't know why that just blanked on me as to which one it was. But like I wasn't thinking in terms of clothing, but when you say it, it just popped in my mind these amazing words that um, the Lord Jesus gives to Zechariah uh, in this vision where Satan, um, the Lord Jesus is referred to here as the angel of the Lord. And for those of you who have seen that phrase in the New Testament, um, most conservative scholars, and I didn't. I'm not a scholar, but I, I used to not believe this when I was first told it until I did a study of every single example of the, of the angel of the Lord. And there's only one where it's a question about whether it's true. The other ones are so black and white that it's the uh, pre-incarnate Christ. It's chapter three. It says, then he showed me Joshua, the high priest. It's not Joshua that we think of after Moses. This is now hundreds of years later. This is Joshua, the high priest. 
he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Now, it says Satan is getting ready to accuse Joshua. Remember, the high priest is supposed to represent the people before God once a year uh, in the Holy of Holies. He's the only one able to go into that inner sanctum. And it says, and the Lord knew that Satan was getting ready to accuse him. And before he could even open his mouth, the Lord says, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Indeed, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now, Joshua was clothed in filthy garments and standing before the angel, which, by the way, should tell us what it is Satan's going to accuse him of. He's going to accuse him of the filthy garments, right? And of, of what filthy garments represent. Verse 4, he spoke and said to those who were standing before him, saying, remove the filthy garments from him. Again, he said to him, see, I have taken your iniquity from you and will clothe you with festal robes. Then I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments while the angel of the Lord was standing by. That's a picture of the righteousness of Christ being applied to children of faith. And Joshua, the high priest, is able to represent the people before God because his righteousness was not his own. And it's the same for us. So now, to go to agree with what you're saying, we now are going to walk out that new identity that is marked by the righteous robes. You pointed out the righteousness. It says created in righteousness. Right. That was a great pickup because I know that I and myself am not righteous, but I was created in righteousness and holiness of the truth when I was recreated as a Christian. So now at that point, we talk about the progressive element of sanctification, which has to do with walking it out. I don't and know. all of it, all of it comes to a head with, with Ephesians 5, walk in love, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. And, I, and the, the pattern at which the Bible brings up love, again, it's everywhere. And it, you know, it's, it's all about love, so to speak. But 1 Corinthians 12 talks about the body of believers. And then 1 Corinthians 13 is the love chapter. Now we have Ephesians 4, unity in the body of Christ. And then we have how to walk in love. So Whatever guesswork or, or as we pivot to application, it's so important to remember that love component, that love aspect of it. Um, and that's my big takeaway is that it's all about others in the context of our sermon series of the church. You know, so if we can if we can just have that attitude of Christ of humility and not being so self-absorbed and self-focused, but look at other people then we will have the ability to to forgive and to love and to serve and and not do the things that we want to do ourselves but, but have that attitude which is in Christ and and that that's the body of Christ that is the church that we're called to be you know so in the context of the sermon series what is our calling what are we to do <laughs> we're to we're to put off the old self and put on make sure we're looking at each other with the new with the white robes of righteousness view others in that way and love them, and serve them, and forgive them, and all those things. And well, I'm, I'm going to jump, though, Mark, just for the sake of driving this point home. Mm -hmm. Again, dress, disagree with, there is that principle of ongoing sanctification, but you made the comment, we need to put off the old and put on the new. I think mm -hmm. right, right, right. Yeah. ourselves to realizing that, what, because I think that's the way it's been quoted to me for years. Right. We've got to stop and say, wait a minute, in view of the fact that we already put off the old, yep. in view of the fact that we already put on the new, now let's live that out by taking these steps of laying aside falsehood, speaking truth, each one with his neighbors, letting no unwholesome word proceed out of your mouth, do not grieve the Holy Spirit, let bitterness be put away, be kind to one, all of that. But I think it's important because I, I, I'll just say honestly, I would say until I'm 64 now, probably <clears throat> age 55, 35 years of being a Christian. I have looked at these things much more in terms of what I still have to do. I have to put this off. I have to put this on. I, mm -hmm. I, would think, I was not taking to heart adequately what God already did. And as a result, Instead of coming from a position of spiritual strength brought on by the righteousness of Christ, I was trying to get myself up to that place. So I think it's it's just important for us to stop and and realize, wow, you mean the old self really? So that, being, 
being justified, you know, when we, when we were justified at that point, we were given that new road, that yes. new clothing. And now we move forward fully clothed in the righteousness of Christ, walking in, walking in the process of and sanctification. It's, it's, it's in response. To that, that's it. It, it, we're embracing a truth, not discovering it for the first time. And so it's, it's the reminder of that. And so it's so funny. And I, I love John, how you're like, I, I'd like to think it's your, your experienced expert mind catching, catching our language saying, okay, no, don't fall into that trap. language, right? Go do it. Yeah. But that's where we're at, right? We're on, we're on a conversation heavy community based podcast where our congregants like to think back on the sermon and see how other people think about it and move forward. And so it's so easy for us to say, okay, here's what we got to go do. Right. There, there's that element of, OK, go and do this. But the heart of the Christian walk is to go and remember what Christ has done. Uh, yeah. and, and that is so hard to do sometimes. Yeah. Hmm. And, so, and I think uh, I, I think that we we need we need eyes to see we need the wisdom of the Lord to help us to wrap our heads around all this because we can go down all these different rabbit trails and then just like how do I do this but back in Ephesians 1 starting in verse 17 that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ the father of glory may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him having the eyes of, of your heart enlightened that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe there I mean, he he has so much for us and we he's he has to give us eyes to see and hearts mm -hmm. that are tender to um to be molded into his image and that's where we we are created he he's doing that work and he has done that work and he is continuing to do that work in us mm -hmm. and that's where we can find a lot of uh hope I mean, hope about how to get a handle on all of this i think we have this inborn tendon inborn not spiritually inborn but inborn kind of of the flesh, there's an inborn tendency that once we understand the gospel, we are able, we tend to say, "Thank you, Lord, I'll take it from." You. Right. Way, you've done all the heavy lifting of forgiving my sin, giving me a new identity, and taking me to heaven. I know you're now resting, sitting on the throne. So I realize it's up to me now to make sure I do everything. Problem is, if I could properly really understand how much more He's completed than that. Yes, I still have a responsibility to do what verse 25 and 26 and 27, you know, that's a responsibility for me. But when I recognize what you were just talking about, the riches that we haven't been enlightened to maybe yet, if I could see the majesty of that, what I would find is that laying aside falsehood is the most natural thing in the world. It's like, oh, yeah, I'm a new person. Speak the truth. Oh, yeah, I'm a new person. Remember your members of one another. Oh, yeah, I'm a new person. You know, um, all the things that he says coming out of this deep appreciation for how new he's made me to be. And I think that helps remove some of the futility because if right. I'm trying to follow kind of the Galatian heresy, Jesus, you did the, now it's not up to me to live it out in my sanctification. I think that's an error on one side. And the error on the other side is to act like I don't have any responsibility at all. Jesus has done it all. He'll do it all. I just need to sit around and be holy. You know, it's it's not that. It's Our view of God it impacts how we respond to life. And we need a bigger view of God so that we are responding in a way that glorifies him. Yeah. Yeah. Mark, did you have something there before we all... Uh... Uh, yeah, I was, for me, I was just thinking of John catching our language, which, I, you know, it's funny because we we know this, we're just, you were just mentioning it to us, John, and, and I fully agree with it, but how we communicate and what we say to the other people around us, I think, especially with this particular identity concept is so vital. Um, and what I was thinking, what I meant, what I was thinking, I was like, wow, just wait till we get to Romans 6, 7, and 8, where Mark is going to be going 
you know, when we're done with this series and we're going to be hammering this home and yes. hopefully maybe then that's, we'll get it. <laughs> hopefully that's maybe a good we'll, we'll see and be able to speak the right language and understand what is, you know, the flesh and what is the old self and what is the new self and how does that interact with each other? Because it, it, yeah. it can, you're right, can confusing. You might mentally know it, but are you communicating it right to other people around you? So yeah. That, yeah. that's what I was thinking. Yeah. yeah. Really, really good. Awesome. Well, Pastor John, thank you so much for being willing to do this with us for a few weeks. It was awesome. Yeah. To, awesome thank to hear you. Thank you for bringing out uh, application and just those hard hitting questions. And I, I really appreciate at the end of the sermon how you what you know the the list of questions that you've had for us each week for yeah, us so to good. yeah dig in and evaluate where where what am i believing and you know and like you said stop behaving like we don't have christ we have christ mm -hmm. we have access to all of these wonderful riches and we can apply and, and don't get don't get caught up in petty stuff like mask or no mask or you know like you, what is your neighbor doing or, you know, all this, all this stuff that is, that's so petty and, you know, not being able to show grace to others because, because of that, you know, I mean, I know you hit that a lot in the sermon. We don't need to touch on it now, but that's just so silly. It's just, you know, we're, we're so much, we have so much more privilege and been given so many more things than that to get caught up in little squabbles and issues and calling each other out for that kind of stuff. You know, so it's, yeah, definitely appreciate it to have application because that's that's why this podcast exists. Super awesome. So, Mark, what do we need to point people towards before we get out of here? My understanding is there's an yep. outdoor FSAT and then indoor the rest of it. What Help me out. Yeah, this is exciting because we are going to attempt for the rest of the summer to go into this. I'll even just throw out this name, an outdoor summer service series. And so on Saturday nights, you know, on Saturday nights, if the weather is permitting, we will attempt to be outdoors. And it will be in a different location than where we've been outside before. It'll be on the other side of the building where the building will cast shade on gotcha. where we would sit. Um, so even if it is a little bit warmer, we would be in the shade. And, you know, so it kicks off this coming Saturday, being 4th of July. And we will be providing food for people um, at 6 o'clock. And then the service starts at 7 so awesome. the goal would be that at seven o'clock from here on out would be when we'd be having these services to just accommodate the potential heat. But knowing that outdoors is a great time um, and that was something that our congregation really seemed to gravitate towards is just being able to be outdoors with each other. And then obviously indoors on Sunday would have the two services in the main auditorium and then fellowship three in the lower level. So that's that's definitely something to kind of keep your eyes out for. Still would need you to save your seat on the website um, to let us know that you're coming. Um, so go to the website for those details. And, um, and this fbcava.life slash RSVP is that spot. Um, and I do know the next three weeks, um, we're still in the church series. Okay. And Donovan Hartog is coming. Um, yeah, he, does he have he has be, three, right? I need to get... He's got three. Yeah, so we're kind of touching on... Um, three different topics still related to the church. Um, one is going to be the alert church and then, then the discerning church and then the fragrant church. So those are fragrant your church. teasers for the next three weeks. Yeah. Awesome. Sweet. Well, thank you three so much for being here. Uh, thank you guys for listening and watching on YouTube. Uh, just remember you can find us on our website. Uh, don't forget to subscribe. Uh, the fact of the matter, everybody, is that sermons are not meant to just take an hour, but rather transform a lifetime. Until next week, much love and God bless. Mm -hmm.